We make more things than any other species in nature. We make buildings, we make infrastructure, we make causes of extreme environments and all the issues that the world is experiencing now. But nature doesn't care. So what we're doing in sustainable design is really for the future of human beings and all the species. And then this ideal pattern is the spiraling pattern where um, species can move from one part to the side, the other part to the side. Now, this, if you like, is a, is a diagram of a progression of what we can do to, to green our city. Okay, we start with um, the city, as you can see, number one. The fourth is where we try to um, transform the built environment. And so let's look at this idea pattern on the uh, last one. Integrating the buildings, it brings vegetation in. We have to create habitats. Habitats with the patches of green on the ground, habitats in, 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 the, uh, in the walls, habitats in terraces, and the roofs and so forth. So this is the best strategy with what we must do in our design. And this is these are the different habitats in different parts of this project. And then within the habitats, we try to identify the fauna species that we want to bring in, a tree-shaped building where we had vegetation that climbs up like a tree. And so um, with the vegetation going up, at the corners of the building, we have terraces. What happens if we start with the green infrastructure, the energy system is green, the water supply is green, the sewage system is green, the systems are green. But anything that we put in after that, becomes make the city even greener. We are, however, confronted by mindsets about our place in nature. Nature is always the other, the thing outside human existence. This underlying belief leads us to a position on design. Yes, we must be sympathetic to nature, conserve it where we find it, but it is set apart. In the 1980s, the construction of a second runway at Mumbai Airport resulted in a series of very disruptive 90 degree bends over a short stretch of the Methi. These disruptions to the hydrology of the area created conditions for annual floods that Mumbai faces every year during the monsoon season. And the worst of these in 2005 uh, cost almost a thousand human lives. Key events and publications from the last 60 years leading to present day thinking on sustainable development. We start off with a position on protecting nature. The only way forward must be to repair and to regenerate. What's interesting here is how ecology is positioned. So the building stacks these social and ecological layers vertically, creating a shared space for human and non-human life while it actively performs ecosystem services. Families who bought a unit here sought to escape the big city, to be self-sufficient in food, energy, water, creating a healthy lifestyle for its inhabitants. There is very good water management here, along with careful selection of vegetation that attracts birds and small animals. In the years since it has opened, Organo Nandi has carried out a series of training workshops to educate farmers and enter into this kind of mutually beneficial relationship with them. What we're seeing in these projects from Kampong Admiralty to Wusong Park, Bilu Yana to Organo Nandi is Asia's answer to regenerative design. Nature not only looks good or makes us feel better, it has real long-term value. These constructed ecosystems done right they expand room for all life, not only ours. And in these emergent systems, the outcome isn't social or ecological, it is both. Now, the problem is that most of what we've been doing over the last 20 to 30 years in sustainability is below that line of neutrality. And what we really need to do is to get above that line of neutrality into the realm of net positive. What is the ultimate in regenerative design? present what I think this means in terms of regenerative materials, regenerative buildings, regenerative cities, and then finally, regenerative landscapes. And this is just made out of plant fiber, agricultural waste, added to mycelium, and it, it grows into this very high performance, completely non-toxic, fireproof insulation. So we can also learn from nature how to assemble those materials in very ingenious ways. And here's a, a house that my office designed based on some of these ideas. So it uses curves to create a stiff shape. And what we should do is we should start by analyzing how a pristine, mature ecosystem in that part of the world would function.
And just as in a real ecosystem, where the waste from one part of the system becomes the input or nutrient for something else in that system, that's what we need to move towards. So one of my colleagues developed a tool that uh, makes it easy to connect up different technologies. So this allows you to put in the resource flows. It shows you anything that is underutilized, and that's a sign that you can add something to the system to create more value. And this, I think, shows the kind of things that we ought to be learning from nature, how to make materials with an absolute fraction of the resource input using local resources, how to make stunningly beautiful, efficient structures, how to foster uh, symbiotic relationships. And above all, I think this points to a new relationship with the rest of the living world. And rather than seeing nature as something separate from us and as something to be plundered for resources, we can see it as a source of wonder and as, as a source of some of the best solutions to help us make progress in ultimately getting to that point where we are participating as nature and co-evolving as nature. The global chemical production, uh, the in, it has increased 50 fold since 1950 and that it's projected to triple again uh, by 2050 compared to 2010. There is a, a fairly daunting statistic, and that is that, uh, that the construction sector consumes 28% of global chemical production, making the construction sector the number one end market. In general, there's a slight indication for a downward trend of the usage, but we're still talking huge amounts, huge, huge tonnage use of these, these chemicals that are, are declared extraordinarily problematic. One way to address it is to use a certification system. But also here, we're simply not targeting in the certification systems the, the substances that need to be targeted. So the question is really how, how do we as practitioners navigate this uh, where we don't have the information we need, we're not, we don't have the knowledge we need. And in many cases, we're simply not aware that this is, we, we think in with blinders on, we think, okay, it's fine in the use phase. If it's fine in the use phase, that's where my responsibility lies. We'll take care of worker safety. That's part of the, the legal apparatus within, within which we operate. But again, there's this huge disconnect. We don't think about communities that are impacted at the site of production of these chemicals. We don't think about potential in, in terms of what if these products are reused. This is the, the core of what should be in a specification, what a client should demand. Phase out properties on the left as defined by the Swedish Chemicals Agency and on the right, the risk reduction properties. And then you pass it along to screening. Uh, as a practitioner, you should screen in your planning process, but certainly on the site, contractors should also be uh, involved in this screening so that safety data sheets are used so that you simply do not have these um, problematic properties. How would your project teams incorporate ideas on regenerative design? What they also understand is that there's things we won't do. Well, one way or another, we do need to develop solutions that, that deliver long-term value. Build less or less square meters and build smaller. Ecology as such is, a, is somehow a common good. It's not something you can take in your pocket and, and walk around with. Um, and so I think, um, you know, we do need to start challenging these situations and, and do our best to, to influence them early on when, when the opportunity exists. The design and the built environment with much better information. So that the people coming out of architecture schools all over the world go into practice and actually do the things that do good instead of doing more harm. Where we've got to get to eventually is a really stretching target and understanding that this is not really an option. This is something we absolutely have to do. So this about convincing our clients, uh, the biggest task for Rumble actually, it's, it's also in our strategy that we need to talk to our clients about this. And you could say back to the question, if the clients are not really in for it, then of course the question is then, is that then a client that we would also have tomorrow?